Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes just magnifying God. Woo! <laughs> it's just awesome. I just can bless myself with my prayer. Hallelujah. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to get blessed tonight. Anybody else going to get blessed tonight? I'm going to get blessed tonight. Come on. It's like, it's like, come on. We got to come hungry. The Bible says those that hunger and thirst will be filled. Hallelujah. Are you hungry tonight? Hung, are hungry? I'm hungry. Second Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 14. Now thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in Christ. The King James says, and manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. And part of what that means is like, that our, because of the success of our life, the, just the spirit of victory and this overcoming spirit that's upon us and, and, and this, this dominance in life, that everywhere we go, there would be this fragrance, so to speak. It's, it's kind of like poetic, like that there would just be this, this air about our life of victory, of peace, of joy. You know what I mean? That people would take note when they're around us, man, there's something different, something different about them. What is it? It's the spirit of faith. It's the spirit of the Lord upon us. It's his anointing upon us. And so the Bible says very clearly in verse 14, thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about tonight is, is you always triumphing. And we don't use the word triumph a lot, but you always overcoming. You always having the victory. You always, we could just use a normal word, winning. Anybody like to win, right? We don't call it cheating. We just, we just look for any kind of advantage that we can find. You know what I mean? Strategic advantage. It's not cheating. It's just a strategic advantage, <laughs> right? It's like the cup game. Some people are like this, heads, shoulders, knees, cup. And then some people are like this, heads, <laughs> shoulders, knees. You know what I mean? It's like they're two inches from the cup. Well, that's, a, that's an advantage, you know what I mean? It's like the one who's up here. It's like, bro, you are done. Head, shoulders, <laughs> knees. You're like a mile a cup. Oh, bro, you're done. But I like to win. And I want to see you win in life. And this is, this is really what the Lord put on my heart tonight, just because, you know, I, I care very deeply about you, and your future is important to me. But so many times we as Christians, we can go through life pretending like we're doing the Word Pretending like we're having done all to stand, stand, but if we really were to evaluate our life, we would have to say, no, I'm not doing the Word. And, and the tragedy behind that is, in the world system, if you work hard, there are different things that, it can, that can appear to be successful, right? And so what happens is when people don't really do the Word, the Bible says not to envy the wicked and not to envy those who have things, right? But what can happen is people aren't really doing the Word. They're not really truly standing on the Word and working the Word and getting results in their life. So they get frustrated because they look at other people in the world who appear to be successful, though they're not, right? Anything outside of God's plan for your life is not successful. And, and so what happens, they become frustrated like, ah, oh, this doesn't work. No, the Word works. We have to work the Word correctly. So I'm going to give you quite a few scriptures tonight and just um, kind of hit on a few things that I think are going to really resonate with you. So, you know, to cause us to triumph is to, conf to conquer, to, to literally have the victory, to literally win in life. That can be in every area of your life. That can, we've talked about this relationally. Right? Financially. Maybe it's in your health. Maybe it's in the peace or the joy of your life. There's tons and tons of promises. And, and, and even like, let's, let's say relationships, for example. You know, the Bible says when a man's ways please the Lord, he will make even his enemies to be at peace with him. So we can walk in such a way that even our enemies don't want beef with us. And the Bible says if you want a friend, show yourself friendly. So maybe that's you, and it's like, gosh, I just really need a good friend. Well, Father, according to your word, you said if I want a friend to show myself friendly, so I'm just going to start showing myself friendly to everybody. And somewhere along the way, something's going to click, and I'm going to stand on the word and believe you, Father, for a true friend, you know, a true brother in Christ. Iron sharpens iron. So one man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Same way for the ladies. You know what I mean? A true friend, somebody I can count on, somebody I can call on, somebody I can talk to. I'm not talking about somebody you can throw up on and complain about how bad your day is and how bad your life is. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a true friend. 
where you can just like visit and like have conversations and send funny gifts to each other. You know what I'm saying? Like just have fun in life. So there's all these promises in the Word. And I want to talk about a few, you know, really uh, a bunch of them resonating in my heart. But let's start, let's start with Ephesians 6.13 because I referenced this, but I want you guys to see. I want you to put your eyes on it. You know, the Bible says, fight the good fight of faith, right? This isn't like a bye. This is not a bye week. You know what I mean? Bye weeks are awesome because you win. You don't have to do nothing. You get to get all rested up and all that, right? But the Bible says in Ephesians 6, 13, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Having done all to stand, stand, meaning continue. Meaning, abide in the Word. Abide in your position of faith. Because faith is the victory that overcomes the world, right? And so, the Bible instructs us, but look, it says that you may be able to withstand. So, if there are some who are able to withstand, then that means there are some who are not able, right? It's kind of like you start putting, like, a couple plates on the, on the bench, I'm out. You know what I mean? Shoulder surgery, Bank art reconstruction, one, two shoulder surgeries over here. I'm tapping out, right? I was going to basically blow up my shoulders. That would be a bad idea, right? So there's some who are able and some who are not able. Just like it would, like, uh, per- pertain that way in strength. Like if, if you, you want a workout partner who's similar in strength to you, otherwise you'd be like, all right, take off all the plates for Pastor Greg, right? And then put all the plates back on for the strong guy, right? Well, the same way we grow in our faith. We grow in our ability to stand. We grow, and how do we do? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, the anointed Word of God preach. It doesn't just come from like, you, you turn on the Bible app and it's like, you know, it doesn't just droning along, just somebody just reading the Word. You know, the Word is anointed, but I'm talking about something where God's anointing mixed with His Word comes alive on the inside of you. And all of a sudden, faith is birthed. Why? Because you heard the Word and you heard the Word and it came alive on the inside of you. And I want that to happen for you financially. See, believers can go through life and and quote scriptures, and say things, and get zero results. Their life is the same, and, and basically they get their paycheck for going to work. Yeah, you and every other non-believer who gets their paycheck for going to work. That's not supernatural increase. Now, I'm not saying we don't, we're not thankful for our jobs, but I'm talking about when you sow a seed, and supernaturally it comes back to you multiplied. I'm talking about miracle kind of stuff, supernatural kind of stuff, that Joe Blow, who just goes to work, just gets his paycheck. Right? And, and we sow seed, and supernaturally things happen. And, and maybe, we, maybe we do get promotions that uh, others don't get. Maybe we do get bonuses. You know, it can come in that way, but we never look to our job as our source. We're constantly looking to our Father God. You are my source. You are my sole source of supply. You have many different avenues. It could come through a random blessing. Somebody giving me money. I didn't do jack squat, and they gave me money. It can come so many different ways. Right? He has many different avenues. He has many different ways to get the resources to you. But it's going to require your faith to activate those blessings coming into your life. It's going to require you believing God, taking him at his word, standing on his word, being full of faith, having done all to stand, stand. And you don't put your negative words on it, right? Just like the Bible talks about people who gather riches to themselves and they put it in a bag that has holes. It doesn't matter how fast it's coming in. It's going out just as fast, right? In the same way, people, Christians, believers, they can experience some blessing, but because of their negative confession, they experience loss. Or maybe they, they, they have some blessing and some things transpire, but because they're robbing God, the enemy, the destroyer, is able to get to that and able to steal it. Right? If, you've got, if you've got a hole in your bag, it doesn't matter how fast it's coming in. If you've left the back door open through robbing God, not tithing, not giving the tenth part. What I'm saying is believers who stand on the word and, and, and speak the word, but they're not even honoring God with the first fruits of their increase. Isn't that foolish? It's like you're trusting God who you also rob to bless you. It doesn't make sense. So let's get into some of these scriptures. Uh, I quoted a couple of these, and, and you can just put them down for your notes. But if it is relationship, Proverbs 16, 7. When a man's ways please the Lord even, he'll make even his enemies to be at peace with him. You guys can get to a place in your life where you're just at peace. You're at peace with people. You're at peace with your neighbors. It doesn't mean you're besties. 
right? It doesn't mean you hang out, but it's like I got no beef with them. I find no fault with them. They're living their life. They're, they're living their best life, okay? If that's their best life, okay. <laughs> no comment, right? Right? But there can be a place where you're just at such peace, and really we should be at peace because strife opens the door to the enemy. So relationships are so important. Uh, Proverbs 18, 24, we quoted it earlier. If you want a friend, show yourself friendly. Don't be like, I'm just believing God. I'm just believing God for a friend. Well, what are you doing? Are you showing yourself friendly? Maybe like celebrate somebody else for their birthday. Like, I just hope somebody throws me a birthday party this year. No one's throwing you a birthday party because you've never thrown a birthday party for anyone in your entire life. You know what I'm saying? And it's like we act like we're standing on the Word, but the Word says to be friendly if you want friends. Right? And so uh, financially, 2 Corinthians 9.10. Let's turn over there. Finance is a, is a big one. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. So we don't love money, but money's neutral. Money is just a tool. People can buy porn with money. People can buy cocaine with money. People can buy a Bible. They can buy a book in the bookstore. They can buy gasoline. They can buy diesel. Money's just neutral. It's just a tool. But when you love money, you got a problem. 2 Corinthians 9, 10. It says, now he that ministereth seed to the sower ministereth bread for your food and multiplies your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. You know, we've talked about this and we can, we'll continue to. Anybody who's around farming understands the power of seed, time, and harvest. You know, Mr. Gerald, he's steady be planting cotton. You know what I mean? And he's praying for rain and he's watering it with, with crop circles and irrigations and getting up way before all of us. And he's driving out to all those fields to make sure that that water's flowing. Because if that water stops flowing, what happens? His crop dies. You know seed's expensive. All these farmers, they start making tons of money. Guess who wants in on the pie? The people selling the seed. Oh, y'all making tons of money? Let me get some of that. Next year, when you buy seed from me, right? Why? Because they want their piece of the action. So, so he's very intentional about making sure that that seed's getting watered because he's got a lot invested. He's got a lot on the line. So Sunday morning, you might see him here at Jumpstart. Well, he's been up for hours <laughs> driving to this crop circle, driving to this crop, because if the electricity went out or there's a problem or something broke or a tire went flat, who knows? So the same way, we should be that invested in the seeds that we've sown, right? Even the seeds of our words, you can start off by sowing these positive seeds. I believe uh, everything I put my hand to will prosper. I believe my seed is working. You know, you go off on all these confessions on day one, praise the Lord. But on day two, you're like, this sucks. I hate this. I, I need a different job. This, my job is trash. My boss is trash, you know. And you're just, just wrecking everything that you did. Instead of just saying, you know what, I planted those seeds yesterday. You know what I'm today? Today I'm going to water those seeds. I'm going to water those seeds. You know what I'm going to do tomorrow? I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Because tomorrow, you know, tomorrow I just had to be silent. But on the next day, I'm ready. Let's go. I'm watering those seeds again. I had to, I had to, I had to have a time out yesterday. And I was like, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. Better, better to just, mm, you're not getting water today. You're getting water tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Okay? But if you, and I'm serious, you can wreck all your progress in one moment of strife. You let a coworker, you, you let a situation, you let a flat tire, you let road rage. Come on, somebody, I'm preaching to myself right now. I'm like, if I wanted to be that close to somebody's bumper, I would have been, but I was back here because I like a little bit of space because my truck weighs 8,500 pounds. You know what I mean? It does, it's, not like a, it's not like a Honda Civic where you can stop on a dime, okay? We need some time here to get the freight train slowed down. And then people pulling, it's like, I don't want your rock chips on my hood, you know what I'm saying, on my windshield, Road rage, I've been delivered right now. I just received that, Father. Yes, Lord, anoint me with, you know, pray, somebody pray for it. Right? You can, the enemy is a punk. He comes to what? Steal, kill, destroy. He's trying to steal the word. Right? You start speaking the word over your finances, he's coming after that word. He's coming after your words. He's trying to change what you're saying because he knows if you keep saying that, it's going to produce fruit in your life. So it's easier said than done. And really what separates the men from the boys, can you still say that in this LGBTQ plus garbage? In the beginning, God created male and female. You were either born with a spout or born without. Come on, somebody, I'm preaching up in here. So what separates the men from the boys, meaning the, 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 the actors from the factors, is can you keep saying what the Word says day after day after day until you start seeing results? 
See, because so many Christians, we act like we walk by faith and not by sight, second Corinthians. You know, we're quoting the Word, and we can say that Scripture, but can we live that Scripture? Because it's easy to live the Scripture on day one when you're so inspired at church like me. Yes, that's so good. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do all those things. Pastor Terry is the greatest preacher of all time. And I get so inspired when she preaches. I'm like, yes, I'm going to do this and this and this, and I'm going to change the world. And then you get home, it's like, let's watch YouTube. You know? <laughs> like, oh, man, all that stuff. I forgot that was like 40 minutes ago. You know what I mean? I was going to change the world. And now I'm like, I'm not changing the world. I'm doing the same thing I do every day. It's easy to fall back in, right? She says, there will always be circumstances and situations and pressures, but the pattern of your life will prevail. So the biggest challenge a lot of times for us as believers is to break the cycle and change the pattern of our life. See, and, and this comes down to your decision. I love that Pastors Dean and Kathy founded this church on Deuteronomy 30, 19. I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. You have to choose life. Just because you choose it today doesn't mean you're going to choose it tomorrow. But if you do, your life will change, and your life will change drastically. This is what separates those from experience all these wonderful promises that we read about in this glorious word, and others who just want all those and believe that they're true but don't ever experience them. Isn't that frustrating? Like, I don't want, like, name your pie, like pecan pie, pumpkin pie, peach pie, hallelujah, coconut cream pie, whatever. I don't want to just sit there and see it and know that it's available but not be able to partake. Right? I, if it's available, I want it. You know what I'm saying? And so how frustrating is it for believers who, who in their mind, they've deceived themselves into thinking, but I'm doing everything right. But if you really took an account of your life, you're not. Because what they're saying when they say, or, or when we say, come on somebody, when we say it's just not working. So what are you saying? Are you saying God's a liar? you saying you did it all right and it's on him? Because I believe according to the word of God, God is not a man that he should lie. The Bible says he watches over his word to perform it. So when we do the word, the word works. So if it's not working, what's broke? We broke. We got to fix it. So I want us to be the kind of believers who having done all to stand, stand. We stand on the word. We do what we know to do because the Bible says it's not the hearers only, but the doers who get results. So the Bible's actually very clear about who gets results and who doesn't. It ain't, the, it ain't the one who has the Scriptures memorized but doesn't really live the Scriptures. Unfortunately, we can get so, so uh, top-heavy, you know what I mean? Like we're full of knowledge, but the actual execution of that in our life is lacking. It would be like, no, you know, no offense, but the guy who just does curls and has got like huge arms, you know what I mean? And, and typically, they got like major biceps, zero deltoids, right? Maybe some tries, you know what I mean? Maybe chest, they're hitting chest, you know what I mean? But, but they skip leg day every time. It's like, bro, you're top heavy, man, you know what I mean? Which is fine if you're a bodybuilder and you wear like, I don't know, work jeans and boots and no one can tell, right? Uh, you know, I, but if you're a football player, it's like you're done. You're done. If you're anything that requires like core strength, leg strength, like you're, you're game over. Do you know what I'm saying? And so believers, we can get so top-heavy where we know a lot of Scripture and we know what the Bible says, but if there's no action in our life, then there's no fruit in our life, right? If there's no execution of what it is that the instruction, that's why the Bible says, my son, attend to my word. Proverbs chapter 4, turn over there. Attend to my word. Incline thine ear unto my saying. Proverbs chapter 4. Y'all, I did so good. I didn't even make like a 420 joke last week. I'm just like, look at me go. Been delivered. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20, just saying. <laughs> and all the smokers are like, <laughs> just kidding. Proverbs 420, ex-smokers. I mean ex-smokers. No more wake and bake. Come on, guys. Proverbs 420, my son, attend to my words Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouse, mouth and perverse lips. Put far from thee. Let thine eyelids look right on. Let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove your foot from evil. 
There's a lot of instruction in there. It has a lot to do with our actions. It has a lot to do with where we're looking. Don't let your eyelids look here or there, right? Ponder the path of your feet. Turn not to the right, to the left. You know, there's a lot of activity that goes along with that. We can quote the promise and say, they are health to all of our flesh. But like, what about all those things about giving diligence to the word, putting our eyes on the word, hearing the word? considering our ways, considering what we put our eyes on. We have to be doers of the Word and not just Scripture quoters. Do you know what I mean? Like we have to actually stop doing the things we used to do. Come on, somebody. Anybody been delivered in here? Thank God I've been delivered. Listen, no, you're not cool because of your testimony. As a matter of fact, Pastor Charity doesn't have the testimony that I have, and she has less baggage or had less baggage to deal with than I had to deal with. Right? So it's not like, I remember even people saying, well, I really don't have that, so I just don't feel like I'm as good of a minister. It's like, you don't need a testimony. You need to know that Jesus has delivered people, and you need to be able to tell them, hey, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Right? All who come to him, he will no wise cast you out. He'll deliver you. He'll save you. He'll heal you. He'll set you free. Right? You don't have to have a testimony of snorting cocaine to be able to set somebody free from snorting cocaine. You don't have to have a testimony of, oh, I used to, oh, I used to drink the most. Oh, you know what I mean? When people think that's cool, that's not cool. What's cool is that Jesus paid the price for all of it. And anybody who wants freedom has freedom available to them if they'll choose it. That's what's cool to me. I don't think like, oh, it's all under the blood. We, you know, we can do it. Like, we all, we all sin, you know. Uh, so sloppy, so cheap, so nasty. Really? It's a cheap, that's a, I don't cuss anymore. That's a crappy version of the truth. That's a deceptive version. The Bible says not to frustrate the grace of God. So cheap, man. Jesus didn't die like naked and like shredded. You could barely, you couldn't even tell that he was a man and give his life and bleed out and was mocked and spit on. They, they smashed that crown of thorns on his head. He didn't do that so you could do a little bit of sip and saint action. So you could get high and be like, it's cool. God still loves me. Really? You're bound by pharmacia and you think that's okay? When, when what Jesus did was so much bigger than that? to set you free. Listen, if you don't want to be free, I'm not mad at you. I'm just saying don't be the kind of believer who says it's okay and makes what Jesus did so cheap. It's so cheap. I'm done with that. I don't, I don't play that game. Like I had a leader in my life, and, 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 and he would kind of say things like that. And there is a reality to there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. God is not condemning us. There is a conviction that says you're better than that, and what Jesus did made a way for you to be free from that. That's a conviction that says, come on up out of that crap. I love that conviction from God. Condemnation is from the devil. He says, you're trash. You've been stuck in that cycle. You'll always be stuck in that cycle, which is a lie. The truth is Jesus broke the cycle, but you have to choose it every single day. You just get up and say, not today, devil, right? I've been given power over all the power of the enemy. I love the freedom, the message of freedom that the gospel actually preaches. Come on, somebody. So, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. Just as the rich rule over the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. So we know from the word of God that when we borrow, we are servant to the lender. And the Bible says, you don't have to turn to all these. I'm going to give you a lot of verses here. Romans chapter 13, verse 8. Owe no man anything except for your obligation to love one another. The Bible says that he'll make us the lender and not the borrower. So we have that promise, and we know that that means borrowing is not a sin because if we're the lender, then we would basically be, you know, What's the word? Accomplice? We would be party to their, their sin. No. But the Bible says he would make us the lender and not the borrower. So we can stand on these promises just like Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and poured into your lap. The amount that you give will determine the amount that you get back. Because the Bible says he who sows sparingly will reap also sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will reap also bountifully. Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth and the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. So, like, I mean, I don't know about you. I don't have a barn yet, 
right? And I'm actually not in the farming business. So, so it's like he will fill your accounts, right? People used to keep their produce, their goods, the things that were of value to them, their resources, they would keep them in barns, right? In the same way, we keep that which is valuable to us, except for Donovan, he keeps his money under his mattress, you know what I mean? He says, you know, I don't trust anybody, man. I don't trust nobody. I'm just going to keep it under my mattress. Just kidding. He converted it all. He converted it all to a, a unnamed currency. It's all Bitcoin now. Can't put Bitcoin under your bed. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right, so we have these promises in the Word. Let's look at a few more as it pertains to our money. Isaiah 55, 11. Let me just give you this and, and, and write down Isaiah 43, 26. 43, 26 says, put me in remembrance of my word. Isaiah 55, 11, so shall my word be. Everybody say, my word. So the Lord says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it will prosper. It will accomplish that which I please. It shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. So in the same way God used his words intentionally, we were created in his image and in his likeness. We are supposed to use our words intentionally as it pertains to relationships, as it pertains to finances, joy, peace. Like, you, you know, your words are creating your world. It's very obvious when you re- read the Bible that our words have such power. And yet people, you know, I don't like the phrase, even though I still am working on not using it, just saying. You know what I mean? I was just joking, man. Right? Sarcasm. What is sarcasm? Saying something that you don't mean. It's saying the opposite. Oh, this is awesome. Right? What do you mean? You mean this sucks. But the enemy will use sarcasm to get us to say things we don't mean so that when we actually say things we mean, we don't really believe it because we've been not believing what we said all week long. So sarcasm, being cynical, saying things you don't mean, it's a perversion of the enemy to get you to not believe that your words are creating your world. Words were not first created for communication. They were created to accomplish things, right? Now, they can be used for communication, but that's secondary. We're framing our world with our words every single day. What you say, the life you have right now is exactly a result of what you've said. I think I'm going to go to the New Mexico Junior College. I think I'm going to get a job. I think I'm going to talk to so-and-so and see if I can get a job at XYZ. And what happened? You got a job at XYZ. Why? Because you framed your world with your words. So your words are working for you whether you believe it or not, whether you know it or not. I'm just trying to tell you, listen, let's get our words working for us in the supernatural. Let's say the right thing and keep saying the right thing. And bless God, we're never going to say the wrong thing. What's going to happen? We're going to start to see biblical level, supernatural results. We've been saying restoration and acceleration, restoration and acceleration. What are we experiencing? Restoration and acceleration. Okay, somebody says, well, we would like to give $80,000 towards, uh, towards the kids' fire week. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> We're believing for 40, we got 80? That's restoration and acceleration. The same way we're seeing it come to pass as we've declared it, corporately it's supposed to work the same way for you and you and you and you and you and you. Don't let the enemy trick you into being like, well, yeah, of course that works for the church. What happens? You just disqualified yourself. You just got punked by the devil, and he talked you out of receiving the exact same thing we're receiving corporately. He talked you out of receiving it personally. Why? Because of your funky attitude. Because of your wrong thinking. I don't know why you're jaded. I don't know why you're mad. Are you mad at the church? Are you mad at Christians? Are you mad at pastors? Who are you mad at, bro? Just repent. Ask God to forgive you. Repent for putting your words on people you shouldn't have put on. And, and, and listen, just because maybe a quote-unquote man and God did something that was wrong or evil, evil or twisted or, or greedy doesn't make God that way doesn't make all men of God that way, right? So don't let the enemy punk you into being mad at the world because some idiot who professed to be a Christian who had no Christ-likeness in his life jacked with your thinking. Just chalk that up to, that, that sucked. That sucked following that leader. Thank God I'm not under that leader that was not Christ-like anymore. And then begin to rejoice and begin to say, Father, thank you that you're teaching me your ways through your word. Amen? So Job 22, 28. You will decree a thing, and it will be established. Hallelujah. Philippians 4.19. My God shall supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. So you have to get that in your heart. you got to put your eyes on that. Philippians 4.19. Open your Bible. Put your ribbon in there. You know what I mean? Get lots of ribbon. Put all kinds of bookmarkers in there. I mean, it's just like the binding breaks because you're constantly turning this and put your eyes on this or, or, or um, screenshot them or copy them and paste them from Bible Gateway app into your notes and just boom, 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 and have one called finances, a note in your phone. Anybody have an iPhone in here? 
Blue bubbles. Come on, somebody. <laughs> oh, man, so-and-so has a green bubble. Uh. <laughs> I'm sorry if you have a green bubble. I'm not mad at you. Even though, even though I do get anxiety when the bubbles aren't blue. Just kidding. I don't, I don't get anxiety. But do you know what I mean? Like, that's a thing. Green bubble, blue bubble. And, of course, Apple isn't going to play nice. And there's other protocols that they could use that would, like, play nicer with everybody. But they don't want to because they want you in their ecosystem. And they want peer pressure to pressure you to get rid of that crappy phone you bought and get an iPhone. <laughs> Listen, the struggle's real, guys. I, I get it. And let me just say, I'm for you. And I apologize that, that Apple has treated you that way. And I understand, <laughs> I understand the pressure that is upon your life. And it's a real pressure because their ecosystem is pretty fluid and nice. And people that enjoy that ecosystem want to pressure you in and welcome you into the family. Just come into our cult of blue bubbles and we will all be happy together. <laughs> right? I'm preaching now. Y'all didn't think I was that hip, you know what I mean? But I'm like, I'm like a hype beast. I'm about to start dropping stuff, like keep it 100, you know what I mean? Don't, you don't say 100. You say, I would like to keep it 100% in here tonight. What does that mean? We got to be real. Where am I financially? Am I literally just all I get is my paycheck, and, and it's, you know, it's a miracle I even still have my job. But other than that, there's no miracles in my life, right? See, I want us to see, like, man, I want us to have testimonies like, man, God made a way. And it was supernatural, and I didn't tell anybody. You don't want to be a manipulator. Oh, man, don't let me catch you manipulating somebody. I'm just believing God for my money to camp. I know the Lord's going to supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Oh, hey, brother business owner. Sorry, I didn't see you there. <laughs> I, was just, I was just magnifying the Lord. You know, I praise him. Praise him in the morning. <laughs> praise him in the noontime. You freaking manipulator standing next to brother business owner talking about how your cars broke down or whatever you need. You know, manipulation may work one time, but you know what you just did? You just made brother business owner your source. And so what happens next time you go around brother business owner and you oh, Lord, and I just thank you for my rent payment this month, and he ain't feeling it no more. And he's like, hey, I just happened to notice, uh, it seems like they always want something from me. And they turn you off and they're done with you. Now all of a sudden, the person that you made your source no longer wants to supply your needs. Because he didn't say, I'll supply all your needs according to my riches and my business. But your father God said, I will supply all your needs according to my riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So when you look at the wrong person as your source, you're in trouble. But if you'll turn your eyes, maybe you've done that before. No, you know, just repent. Father, I turn my eyes to you. I've looked all these different ways. I've looked to my Sancho. I've looked to my boyfriend. I've looked to my girlfriend. I've looked to my baby mom. I've looked to whoever. I'm looking to you for my for my, I'm looking to you for my peace. I'm looking to you for my joy. I'm looking to you for my hope. I'm looking to you for my confidence. I'm looking to you, Father, for my future. You are my hope, and you are my source, and you are my supply. You're my everything, Lord. You're my sufficiency. You're my all in all. I don't need people to make me feel good about myself. I don't need a job. I don't need a title. I don't need to live in this neighborhood or that. You're my everything. My confidence is in you. My hope is in you. It's no longer performance-based. Jesus broke the cycle, right? Just like Pastor Dean says, if you can't live good enough to earn your salvation, how could you live good enough to keep your salvation? So there's no more performance pressure, which actually breaks that bondage off. And what does that do? It sets you free to just advance in the liberty, in the freedom that belongs to you. Just like an athlete would train either with a parachute or maybe with like a weighted vest. And they would exercise and they would exercise and they would practice with that vest on. But when it came time for competition, what would they do? They would take that weight off. Why? Because they're fixing to win. So when you, when you take off the vest of, or the weight of performance, now all of a sudden you're free to win. Why? Because you're looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. It's not about you, how good you look, how you perceive. Just get over that. I don't care how I'm perceived. I couldn't care anymore. I don't care. There's, there's no care about how I'm perceived. So what does that do? That takes the pressure off to perform. See, why do we as Christians think that we can perform and look a certain ways? Well, obviously, we do it for our peers when we have wrong thinking. But, man, God, all things are open before the Lord. You're, you're not, you might fool your friends, maybe, but you're not going to fool God. So the easiest thing to do is just humble yourself, repent, and say, Father, I've done this all wrong. 
and I'm turning tonight, and I'm changing my ways, and I'm looking to you because I want to be an overcomer. I want to be a victorious Christian. I want to win in life. I want to win in relationships. I want to win financially. I want to win in my health, and I know that you made a way, and I know that I've done it all wrong, but I'm going to fix my life on the Word of God. I'm going to set my attention on your Word. I'm going to build my life on your Word. I'm going to stand on your Word. I'm going to speak your Word, and I'm not going to let the enemy steal the Word from my heart. And that Word will produce. We talk about it. You could even get used to it around here. Build your life on the Word. It's all about the Word. Read the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word. And then you could be like, yeah, it's all about the Word. Build your life on the Word. You could say all the right things. But if you don't truly establish your belief system based on what this says, Renew your mind, which is the biggest part, changing the way you think, to think like this says. And this says, I don't care what it looks like, my God will supply. And then when you get your first testimony where supernaturally God came through and you didn't tell brother business, you didn't tell nobody but him on your knees in your closet and he came through for you, you'll never be the same. Because you know the creator of heaven and earth, the one true God, heard your prayers answered your prayers, met your need, and he was your source. He was your supply. He was your everything, and you'll be hooked for life. So let me give you a few more scriptures, and then we're going to break out into small groups. I gave you Philippians 4.19. Just jot a few of these down. Proverbs 10.22, the blessing of the Lord makes a person rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. So you profess that. Father, your blessing is working in my life. Hallelujah. You know what I mean? You're shopping with your friends, and your friends are like buying all this stuff, and you're like, where'd you get all that money from? You got it from your parents. That's where you got it from, right? Or, or, or maybe they work at a job and they, they have expendable resources that you don't have. Well, you got two choices. Be all butthurt and mad at God or just say, Lord, you are my joy. Ha, 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 You're my joy, Lord. I would like to buy some things, but I'm not going to spend money I don't have. Just like Pastor says, when your outgo is more than your inkeem, then your upkeep will be your downfall. Right? You don't want to get behind the eight ball and backed up and then tons of credit card debt and you're paying a minimum payment that's like you know, a lot. When it's like you look at that minimum payment, you're like, oh, man, plus all this interest. Man, I could be actually buying stuff. I could be giving that money to the kingdom. Well, if you've done that, if you've put yourself in that position, the Lord is faithful. He'll help you out. But you can't keep living foolishly and call it faith, right? Living by faith is living by faith. Living foolishly is living foolishly. You can jot down 2 Corinthians 9, 8. We talked about it earlier. God will generously provide for all your need. Then you'll always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Is it hot in here? My God, do we have air conditioning? Father, supply our needs, Lord. We need the elect- Lord, we need the money for the power bill. We need to pay the electricity, Lord, so we can pre- turn up our air conditioners, Lord. Turn them down. Turn them colder. <sighs> all right. Let me give you a few pertaining to your health. Exodus 15, 26. I'm the Lord God that healeth thee. Exodus 23, 25 through 26. You shall serve the Lord your God, and, and he shall bless your bread and your water and take sickness away from your midst. Tons of scriptures on here. Tons of scriptures on here. I love Matthew chapter 8. And behold, there came a leopard unto Jesus, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. What is, what is he saying? If someone says, if you will, you can make me clean. That means he knew that he could. He didn't know if he would. So many Christians are in that position. They don't believe that they believe that they believe that they know that it's God's will for them to be whole. So if you don't know that, that's the the very basics. That's the general foundation for believing for something that belongs to you. So the leper was in the same position as many Christians. I know you can. I just don't know if you will. A lot of people pray, Father, we just pray that if it be your will, you heal sister so-and-so. Nevertheless, not our will, but your will be done, Lord. That's a crappy prayer. That's a non-biblical prayer because we know Scripture after Scripture that it is His will, right? Third John 2, beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So there's all these keys in the Word. It has all the answers. Wow, then the prosperity of my soul is tied to my, my prosperity financially. The prosperity of my soul is tied to my prosperity physically, financially, all those things. So the Word is very simple but so many people, they, they make it complex. They make it harder than it really is. So I just want to encourage you, whatever it is, obviously, you, you guys have Google, right? So like anything, you could say, Scripture's on, fill in the blank. Depression, right? Fear, anxiety, insecurity. 
Study in him realities, who you are in Christ Jesus. Study whatever it is that you need and stand on those scriptures. Don't just say, oh, I'm just believing God. What does that mean you're believing God? Tell me what scriptures you're standing on. Right? And you need to be able to say, boom, 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 boom. It's like, okay. Then you're standing on that word. Then you really are believing God. And you know what? He's not a man that sh he should lie. And be it unto you according to your faith. I love that the Bible says, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible.